Okay, hello and good evening everyone. Today I'm speaking to Donald Brown, South African, based in Seapoint, and he used to have a YouTube channel called Worldview that I participated in and they censored it, and it's not because of me. So, Donald, welcome. Thank you, Ihu. It's great to be here, and it's great to be... I mean, I think it's the first time I'm in the opposite seat, so thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah, and you're actually being interviewed from France, so uh, welcome. It's your first cross, cross-continental cross interview, if you haven't done yeah, any other. Yeah, Thank you, you know, so much. So the reason I'm doing this tonight is um, I heard the unfortunate news that YouTube censored your channel. What what was the story behind that? So we interviewed Nick Hudson about six, seven months ago. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if I can say his name even if a YouTube mm-hmm. algorithm picks it up. But um, so he's the founder of Panda and that organization fights the jab. I'm going to use that word, the jab mandate and forced jabs and the lockdowns they they oppose oppose the official government ideology yeah and what's interesting is that video got like 160,000 views it went viral Mm. and our what the conclusion we reached is because it went so viral i mean and we we discussed we even discussed subjects like um the so-called horse dewormer i'm not going to say that word and um the the medicine that donald trump used to treat COVID. yes we and and i mean the video stayed online i mean it's incredible we 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 don't really know what happened there and we we thought okay that was a success why don't we invite this guy back like four or five months later and discuss the same subjects and we literally did that and poof the first moment it was uploaded it was gone and then we tried and we the conclusion we reached is because perhaps you mentioned too few too many names like yeah. Bill Gates, like the leader of the World Health Organization. And because he mentioned those names, we have to edit and remove them. And then the leader and, of the the leader of the World Health Organization is not a member of the Marxist inspired Tigre Liberation Organization. Not that guy. Um, <laughs> but um, so we removed all that and we uploaded again. And what's interesting, it stayed online. It wasn't removed instantly. It was, it stayed online for six, seven days. Mm. And then we thought, okay, we we usually create a promo for each video. So we created a promo for that video. And before we uploaded it, that video was removed again. And so we thought, okay, we're gonna appeal it. We appealed it. It was successful. The appeal was successful. It was reinstated. So then we uploaded the promo. The promo was removed. We appealed it, wasn't reinstated. Then the full interview was removed again after it was reinstated and we appealed it, was unsuccessful. Then we had two strikes and then with a month to go before all two strikes expired, they decided to go for that interview seven months ago, which was basically, it was shadow banned. I mean, there's no other way to put it. If you Googled, if you searched Worldview Nick Hudson, you could not find that video. It was impossible. It had 160,000 views. You could not find that video. And it was removed of a month ago and poof, our channel is gone. So it's, it's almost like, I don't know, it's, 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 it's so, it's, 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 it's like it was a plan. But I mean, it, obviously we're not big enough for that to be a plan. But I mean, yeah. It, but but do you wonders. think it's just an algorithm or do you think there was actually a person sitting behind us? I think eventually they realized with the second interview, we have attraction that if we keep on getting views, that old video is going to keep on getting views. So they realized they had to get rid of that old video. It, it cannot stay there. So they decided to go for that old video. Even though it was shadow banned, the people, this channel is obviously growing. So the viewers are obviously going to keep scrolling down and find that video. So they had, they had to get rid of it. I think that's what happened in that scenario. Because if, if it got 160,000 views, a lot of people had to report it. YouTube had to know about it. There's no way nobody reported that video. Someone from the health, Wolf Health organization probably reported like 10 times. So I think, yeah, that, that's my... Um, it's strange. I, uh, yeah. I mean, you're, you're one of many. I had, I had one of mine removed as well with the same character, by the way. I called it the uh, disease archipelago, and then they removed it. So I thought it was quite ironic, but um, you know, that was like when after this thing started a few months into it, when we realized that... You know, there's a lot of propaganda and BS being spewed about um, the disease. Um, but you know, it's 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 strange. I mean, um, so so how how is this impacting you? What is uh, I mean, did you did you have to cancel any interviews or things? No, no, not at the moment. But the good thing is, the sort of I've I have for a long time been considering merging with other YouTube channels because 
just practically I cannot do this all on my own. I mean, to because I want Worldview to become a business and it's just impossible yeah. to do all of that on your own. I mean, you need some help. And so this basically prompted us to start searching for another YouTube, YouTube channel or person that's interested in this sort of topic to merge with them and to truly be, get some investors involved, get some sponsors involved. And that's what we're doing right now. So this is sort of a, I, I would say this, this is still, this, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, I, I want to say lining. silver. Yeah. Silver. Yeah. To the entire story that, um, it basically prompted us to, to do what we wanted to do for a long time. Um, and everything was backed up. Everything is backed up on Odyssey. So we didn't lose any content. We can simply download all the content and Odyssey and upload it to a new channel that we merge with. So there's no okay. content lost. Because but, but I, there's, there's viewers lost, obviously, and that generated... That's yeah, uh, not necessarily, because um, this channel we're planning on merging with basically had a close relationship with Worldview. I mean, literally, you could see in the analytics suggested videos of a worldview video was almost always with Nisport. So it's a close connection between our two channels. So I think almost if we simply just uploaded our videos to this new channel, almost nothing would change. Okay. So, I mean, at least you've got a plan for the future, but I'm still baffled, like, um, you know, where this is going to take us, this idea that uh, we constantly have to walk on eggshells about conversations. And the problem I have is that when you read uh, YouTube or Twitter's uh, user terms of an agreement, um, it's so vague. I mean, anyone can yeah. derive any censorship from that. Mm. Yeah, what's always funny is they always have that sort of legal last note where they say they list all these things. These, um, uh, If you don't agree with this, your video will be terminated. The last one is always, but at the, at the end of the day, this company reserves the right to make its own decision on what to remove or not. So it's basically like you can, you can, uh, you can on all different ISIS will do but if if you don't, we're gonna get rid of your video. If we if we don't like your face, we're gonna yeah. get rid of the video. It's basically they have always this last clause, this legal clause where they where they can determine self what they want to do and what they don't want to do. Well, there there was a concerning article in Mint Press News, uh, supposed to be Russian propaganda, but it's not. Um, that uh, there's a lot of former FBI and CIA agents now working for Twitter. Okay, apparently, there's like a revolving door over there and they, they took the same mindset to them as well where you know you need to silence information so a lot of the culture and tradition comes from that um it's unfortunately the world we live in i i think people need to be a little bit more skeptical about these platforms mm. and you know she said find find some alternatives i mean i i'm not, I, I'm not pivoting away from them entirely i know uh, jeremy nell i don't know if you've interviewed him he's completely no. off um, he's completely on telegram and on odyssey and oh, what, is, it, is it he um from germ warfare yeah, Jim Wolfe, yeah. Okay. No, yeah, I've, yeah. I've seen his interviews. I have not interviewed him. Oh, okay. No, he's, he's completely off. Um, and I asked him, and he's like, yeah, but once you get used to making money out of outside of YouTube and outside of Twitter, um, you know, it doesn't bother you anymore. And he says, well, he managed to do so. So, you know, good to him, I guess. Yeah, I think that the problem with that is YouTube still has the huge user base, um, viewership, and it has that algorithm that makes your videos go viral which many of the other plat platforms like Spotify doesn't have. I mean, you can literally have a video that's uh, all of a sudden gets like a million views and you can't really explain why, but that that can get your channel the traction it needs. And then you shoot from that. But yeah, and, and Spotify, yeah. you, you you can't manage to do that really. But Twitter, Twitter can do that as well. But I mean, um, it's yeah. a little bit different though. It's not big videos, it's usually clips, you know, like uh, five second truths that just goes around. Yeah. But what worries me about all of this is the sort of argument they keep getting back to is that we have to adhere to the standards of the World Health Organization. And the problem with that in the long term is what I see is eventually everything is going to be, okay, if you're against climate change, you have to, or against the, the, uh, the common consensus, you have to um, adhere to the standards of the world health of the U United Nations. We, we, we are moving back into medieval times. If you disagree no. with the pastor and the parson, I'm sorry, um, you're a heretic. Um, you're mm. now a climate denier, you're a COVID denier, you're a this denier, you know, just, you know, even things like um, more subtle, for example, like asbestos, I was looking at the other day. I know there's two types of asbestos and white asbestos is not as carcinogenic as the other one. It's as, as carcinogenic as sunshine. Well, apparently YouTube has started censoring that fact as well. And they're like, no, all asbestos is bad and that's the end of the world. You know? 
Yeah, I've heard that literally um, videos of Tony Fauci and other members of the world, I cannot, like he's not a member of the World Health Organization, but members of the World Health, world, world Health Organization, those videos were removed from YouTube just because they had words that conflicted with the algorithm. So, I mean, here you have representatives of the so-called organizations that YouTube are trying to protect, and those videos get removed just because there's a word or a sentence that conflicts with the, the common algorithm. So, I mean, it's really, it's, it's not only just a problem of, um, censorship it's this reliance on this algorithm that uh, i mean the problem is also that once you say the so-called anti-vaxxers are not allowed to post videos on youtube basically you're also saying that vaxxers are also not allowed to post on youtube because everyone is so scared of the topic now if you just yeah. say the wrong word or the wrong sentence you, you, your channel might disappear. I mean, that's uh, that's what happened on Worldview. We don't just uh, not no longer talk with the so-called anti-vaxxers. We don't talk with the vaxxers as well because we're so scared of this topic. And that was that's what happens to many um, YouTube channels. That mm -hmm. that subject it disappears entirely from YouTube. But 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 this is the problem. I, I think we're all going to face eventually is that you know it's, there's probably some kind of word sense algorithm. That you know, it just uh, speech to text analysis, and it's like, oh, he spoke about vaccines. You know, he's probably a bad person, and therefore we can, you know, sense him. Because let's face it, there's just too many videos going around. You can't watch all of them, so the only way they can do it is using a computer, and that's always got an inherent logic to itself. And there's always going to be, you know, nuance and gray areas that's lost to it. And I think you also have to fight this idea that YouTube has to get involved in this this game entirely. It, it's just literally impossible and impracticable. Impracticable. Fuck, I'm screwing up that word. But anyway, um, to rely on an organization like the World Health Organization, which is basically to a large degree owned by a government like China. I mean, you can't put it any other way. I mean, and the United Nations is essentially owned to a large extent by a Chinese bloc. I mean, the entire Africa. Or, or, the, or, or the US bloc, permanent members of Security Council, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I mean, it's 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 essentially, a, you can des describe it as a proxy war between the United States and China. And I mean, now we're getting involved in that, but we have our own problems. We, we it's it's not practical to- I, I, Yeah, but, but that's the thing though, geopolitics is real. I, I mean, that's some, one of the lessons of the last two years is that a lot of what occurred worldwide is geopolitical. So, I mean, a lot of the COVID measures made no sense from a health perspective perspective but it made completely sense from a war perspective if you're mm. having a geopolitical war with china um you're going to have supply chain shortages so you have to impose food and energy rations and travel restrictions on your domestic population so we've gone through two years of wartime rationing this is what it was like you know mm. just because of this this craziness mm. and i think perhaps china is aggravating the situation just to distract it from the fact the Chinese government has unleashed a virus on the world and nobody has been held really accountable. I mean, well, now well, we're... Did, did they really release it? I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical of that. I, I, I don't buy the entire narrative. I think it's all was a bloody bunch of rubbish from beginning to end. But so you don't think the Chinese government was involved at all? Like, yeah. um, well, if you look at the original photos of victims falling dead um, in the street, that wasn't the Chinese government. That was the Taiwanese government. Okay, that came from Tomoko News through the National Endowment for Democracy that has got ties to the US CIA. Okay, so we don't even know if the real footage coming out of China is, is true or not. We do know, however, that China has, is imposing very strict conditions on its domestic population. I can confirm that with my colleagues that are Chinese. Um, but the other thing is, I am a heretic on this entire topic. I don't believe that um, anything that happened the last two years was remotely true. I think it was all just a pack of lies from beginning to end. And um, I've read up on the history of PCR and all the stuff. I won't get myself the platform now. Um, I'm not convinced of the science. I, I, I'm, I'm so far off the heretic spectrum at this stage. So I, 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 I think it was all just a pack of rubbish. I think it's a propaganda war primarily. And I think it's a geopolitical war. Um, that is being staged. And I think what's happening is the West wants to decouple from China and bring the supply chains home. And we, as the domestic population, is paying the price for that. And how do you tell your domestic population that? Well, creating a scary virus is one way to do so. Yep. Okay, but I mean, um, okay, yeah, I, okay, I understand the point. I'm just saying that um, 
we we the, the, we're sort of in this war between the so-called vaxxers and anti-vaxxers when the real issues are well, that, that's classical interested. propaganda you make your yeah. population fight over each other you create factions but so I guess we, we sell them we sell them a story and they they fight over whether they should get injected or not injected for something that's probably not dangerous if i look at the stats of people dying from the jab and if i look at the, the people dying of the disease it's even less dangerous so basically what i'm saying is they're trying to make you fight over small numbers and we're trying to i mean if you look at all cause mortality for the last two years you barely see the needle move in every single country it's maybe a little bit higher in the united states than canada you know you can and then we zoom in on it and we obsess about it and then we say is this the guy who died from a heart attack during a sports exercise or is this a guy who died from um, his mother neglecting him is this really the deadly virus etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's constant constant propaganda and they get people fighting over that stuff and i think it's all been a pack of lies um so you think the virus was created no, so, I don't think there's any virus at all. I think it's just the rebranding of flu. Very simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm not laughing because um, I don't think that's possible. I, I'm laughing. I, I I don't see how this video. Oh, stays I don't think <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, probably not. But uh, that's basically what I'm thinking. I, I think it's 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 all been just a a whole hoax from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. um and uh, we saw this with other diseases in the past i mean it's a very good book on this called virus mania um going back all the way to the aids pandemic and i um i'm a heretic on that subject as well so you know but um yeah the if i look at the all, all cause mortality i see no justification for wow. any of the measures that were taken in the last two to three years and um i see um, all that I'm seeing is a decoupling from China and I'm seeing massive geopolitical implications. And the guy who I've been quite influenced by on this has been Denis Rancourt in, in Canada, who's done a, a remarkable study going through most countries in Western Europe and, and um, United States, showing exactly what many of us have suspected, that there is very little that sense you can make out of the data. And he makes the point as well that this is about geopolitics primarily. And if he is correct, these measures will continue for another 10 years because that's how long it can take to decouple from a big body like China. So we're not out of this. Um, I'm very pessimistic about that. But just practically, um, do you think this war is winning, this geopolitical war, that, that it's, it's successful in achieving its aims? Because just take, for example, I think like easily like 50% of South Africans are vaccinated and 50% are not. I, I mean, I'm pulling that figure out of the air, but it, it clearly... it. It shows that the mainstream. I, I, I don't narrative... think South Africa is part of the the larger context. I, I don't think what matters in South Africa matters at all to the rest of the world. We're too small and too unimportant to be important. Um, so they don't care about Africa. They don't have to care because Africa is not as big player. The economy is much smaller. The supply lines for resources in Africa is not really politicized. The cold supply chain is very stable. I think it's 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 about the rest of the world primarily, um, and and we are spectators in a way. In a way, Africans are fortunate. Um, we have an incompetent government that can't enforce these measures. Um, COVID has totally exposed the incompetence of our government to be totalitarian. Thank goodness for that. Despite the best intentions, they couldn't even get the army mobilized. Um, so no, I don't think so. But if you look here in France, you look in Europe, I mean, see it in the context of the Ukraine war that's occurring at the moment as well. I mean, there is um, uh, uh, the Ukraine war is, is clearly a decoupling from Russia that is occurring. It's clearly a geopolitical proxy war. I'm not even sure if that I'm allowed to say that yet on, on, on YouTube, but it's obvious if you follow the facts that this was about NATO expansionism. Okay, that's not Russian propaganda. The United States staged a coup d'etat in Ukraine in 2014 to overthrow a democratically elected government to get a pro uh, a pro a pro Western anti Russian government elected. They provoked Russia, and they wanted the war. I don't think they expected the war this time. Maybe Putin tried to preempt them a little bit. Um, doesn't justify Putin's invasion, but all of this, I think, is just geopolitics. It's it's bigger maneuvers that's going on, uh, while the domestic population, us, we pay the price for it. Now, you and I probably don't pay such a bigger price, but I think the working class people pay the biggest price. Yeah, especially in South Africa. I mean, with like seventy percent of the youth unemployed. I mean, unemployment generally just rising. I mean, we're we're having this massive situation where. And it's so, I mean, these, these are first world problems. I mean, South Africans struggle to understand why should I care? I, I, I can't, yeah, that, this is the dumbest thing about for me is why a video is removed 
when most South Africans don't really, I mean, they've, they've made their minds up whether they get the vaccination or not, the, the jab yeah. or not. They don't, they don't care anymore. It's, 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 we've moved on. So, well, I, yeah. I think YouTube just say they just took an algorithm approach. They probably messed up with the algorithm the first time. Maybe there was a real person and it was like, I like this video. Maybe I'm, I'm convinced by Nick's argument. And then the second review, it went up for review. And we're like, wait a minute, I don't want this, this guy saying stuff. But I, I think that the, your, your video channel is just, you know, it's just part of them also showing who's boss. I, I don't think actually it's about silencing the ideas. It's more about showing who's at the top of a dominance hierarchy. And they want to sort of stamp in, in their authority to say, well, watch it. You know, Next time you say something else about um, a controversial topic, you know you need to you know, uh, step on eggs. But I mean, just practically, how is that sustainable for a business model? I mean, they're basically creating these platforms like Odyssey, Spotify. Well, well I mean, they could be to fail at this stage. I mean, the amount of money they get from U.S. governments um, is extraordinary. I mean, also, this is another pet beef of mine, but this idea that a entrepreneur in his garage started Google or Apple, um, it's complete nonsense, or Microsoft. No, I mean, most of these guys were kickstarted and funded by DARPA which is the you know, US military's hedge fund. So a lot of this is heavily tied to the military industrial complex. And that's why people have been calling them Pentaco, Pentagon tube. You know, so it, it, this is part of, a, it's a military approach to problem solving as well. We just squash the bug that, that comes up. Yeah, no, I, yeah, it's strange. It's very strange. And yeah. One hopes yeah. that the, the, the problems I just see, yeah, like I said, the long-term problem is that one, I, I, I'm generally worried about what you can post on YouTube in the future. I mean, it's it's literally... Well, well there it, are other generally... channels now. You, you've got Rumble, you've got um, Odyssey, you've got other platforms. Um, but I, I think YouTube for the time being is still going to do it. If they continue on this path, I agree, they'll kill themselves in the process. I mean, YouTube is different than 10 years ago. Um but I, I think at this stage, the people in control of the man of the management and narratives and stuff have um, they've so internalized this narrative that they have to be following the experts and the science. They believe the crap, you know. This is this is propaganda. They they fell in through their own narrative, so I don't think they can walk back anymore. I think they they're just going to create their own death in the process. Yeah, it's ironic that the creators of Google and YouTube would fall into a bubble. I mean, there's literally the software or a, a website that's literally almost created to to expand the bubble. And it's, yeah, yeah it's interesting that these, that, I mean, in a sort of, in a, in a um, ironic sense, it's also probably, it makes sense that they would fall in this bubble because the investors, the people with the money know the power they have and they approach these people and they slowly warp these people to their point of view. The, the academics, these people, yeah. Um, well, I mean, this is what we, um, what, what uh, Joel uh, Gottkin, I write with, have wrote in his recent book called Neo Feudalism. It's Neo Feudalism a warning to the middle class. And he's basically saying that the academia, academics today, are basically acting like the clerisy did during the time of the aristocracy. So you've mm -hmm. got a feudal, um, Silicon Valley feudal lords, um, tech oligarchs. And um, they're getting, you know, all praises and pleases by people um, from the university. And critical thought has gone out of the window. And, and the problem with the old aristocracies, they were really stupid. Uh, and I think this one is just going that way. You know, they, they tend to be clever first generation, but I'm not so sure if their children are that clever. Yeah, I mean, I've said that there's no, no real difference between socialism and feudalism. I mean, if you just compare, there's no real difference between the Duke of York and the Minister of Sport. They're both sort of hereditary titles, the titles of nobility. And yeah. you're increasing, increasingly seeing that as the state grows. I mean, we're basically, like you're saying, reverting back to a sort of feudalism where... Well, uh, are, just... are you sure it's the state that's growing or is it private property that's also concentrating? Because I, I tend to think that the bigger problem today is not government control, but it's monopoly, you know, centralized authority. No, I, I definitely think the state is growing. I think if you compare the figures of government spending and tax collection, tax collection with today, with 100 years ago, there's a massive difference. I think in the United States, I think it was like 10% of um, uh, money on it. Uh, I'm screwing up the figures now, but yeah, uh, how do I put this in English? Um, 10% of all money was collected by the state 10, 100 years ago, and today it's yeah. like 50%. I think that's a 
I'm paraphrasing, but that's sort of the general idea. So the state has definitely grown. I think there's no question of that. Yeah, but my 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 bigger concern is the fact that there is high business monopolies that are controlling, having influence over policy, and it's sort of like an interwoven matrix more than it is about a, you know, it's it, it's not really a communist state that has central authority, because I mean, what you find in America, for example, a lot of policies are made in think tanks that are highly fun, financed by oligarchs. And then that policy gets translated through elections into into regulation and and um, and policy. So I I don't see the state as I mean the state is obviously an issue and the state creates the mechanism for that to occur. But a, a bigger issue to me is that they haven't enforced antitrust laws in America for a very long time. Yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely not so clued up on this like you are. But I think the problem here is that. The state is lo- like the drug dealer, and the, the 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 businesses are like the drug user. So, if you want to get rid of the problem, you you need to get rid of the drug dealers and not the drug users. I mean, the the reason there are so many lobbyists is because the state has so much power, and especially in a case like South Africa. If you just reduce the power of the state, the private sector. Um, yeah, well, I, I would agree. In South Africa, it's different. I mean, we have an incompetent state as well at it. So even if you pay a lot of money, you don't get anything back. I mean, in Europe, at least you get some money back. So yeah. you, know, you can say, well, this is a cute project. It sort of works. I like the swimming pool the state is doing here. You know, in South Africa, the swimming pool doesn't exist. Just out of interest sakes, how, how much money do you pay on income tax? In general, how much money do you pay in, in terms of taxes in France? Um, good question. It's around 30 something percent. Huh? 30 percent in total. Yeah, but uh, you got to be careful because, um, yeah, so it's between 30 and 41 percent. 41 percent is if you earn over 73,000 euros, and it's only 30 percent, um, if it's less than that. But of course, we have tax on fuel and we have VAT, and I'm not sure what the effective income tax is, but it's, um, I suspect I pay, I would pay less than I would pay in South Africa, to be honest. And France That's is considered a socialist country. It's not yeah, that yeah. socialist. I mean, uh, highways, for example, are privatized in France. Um, you know, interesting fact on that. So the there is a lot of, I mean, the word uh, George Bush at one stage was famous for saying um, that the French have no word for entrepreneur. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so um, no, there's a lot of business here. They actually do have a capitalist culture as well. I mean, yes, there is a big socialist movement, but it's not all that's here. So is it just highways, not roads in general? It's just highways. Yeah, it's it's highways. So there's an alternative highway that they have to build as well, which tends to be crappier. So you can choose to take the alternative or the or the highway. But Vancy, well, it's questionable if it's totally private because it's sort of like a sunroll that works. Um, but either way, if you use the highways, there's toll roads and the tolls pay back for the highway. Um, but and... that's interesting. Why why would they just decide on the highway and not just general roads? Why would they just like pri- um, partly privatize roads? Well, I guess if you have roads that you commute with every day, it will not be politically feasible. And they have different levels of government as well. So different governments have different responsibilities. And that's actually quite well kept in France. Um, so despite being a, having a central Paris, there's only some things that the mayor or the, um, what they call mayor in English, the, the mayor basically can do. And the local office, they, they've got very predefined um, uh, responsibilities in the French constitution um, and throughout law that they can enforce. And then they have electricity that is now being renationalized, but it was almost nationalized anyways. But highways are privatized. But even the electricity company trades as a private company. So EDF, which is Electricity de France, has to compete under European laws with um, European other companies. So even the state where it is state centralized is forced to compete and that has um, you know made it a little bit better in europe yeah i think the problem is the sort of idea that the country is either socialist or capitalist when it's never the uh, no true. It's, it's i mean a, it's, it's a mix and it, and it depends i mean you really have to go into the detail of the policies um because i mean you have you had socialists in france at one election that says we want said we wanted to reduce the taxes I said, well, okay, I, I'd vote for those socialists, I suppose. You know, so. yeah. I think you have now conservatives in the UK that want to raise taxes. Yeah, so it's uh, these, these are just words at the end of the day. Yeah. Mm. They, all, they, all they care about politicians is just to get re-elected. And I mean, they change their slogans just to do that. If they think the tide is changing and that in favor of raising taxes or lowering taxes, they do that. I mean, it's incredible how successful the conservative party has been. I think that party has like existed for what now, 200, 300 years? They've just con- continuously rebranded themselves. 
Yeah, but but is it then the question is asked? Is it really the same Conservative Party as before? No, definitely not. No. So on your on your channel, what um what what type of talks are you going to continue to cover? Because you did quite a, you had quite a few interesting um hosts or guests. Um, well, we just spoke to Rob Hirschhoff, um, the billionaire in South Africa. Oh, that's yeah. outspoken. Um, yeah, I don't want to get myself into trouble with my opinions on him, but he's an interesting guy. <laughs> okay. I don't think he's, he's that politically astute. Um, I think he spent a lot of time abroad and he sees the problems in South Africa and he wants to do something about those problems, but I think he has the perhaps the wrong mindset of, okay, any solution can solve the problem. That's not always the case. You can always make a problem worse. I mean, that's literally yeah. the, the argument the EFF makes in parliament where they say all these advocates appear in parliament and they say, if you um, continue with expropriation without compensation, that's going to make, that's not going to work. It's going to make, make the situation worse. And then they say, how can it be worse? These people are living in townships. How can it be worse? I mean, the appropriate oh, response oh. to that is look at Zimbabwe. The people are literally begging for food over there. It can look always look at, always get look at Cambodia, worse. look at Timor. Yeah. You know, it's, it can it's... always get worse. That's that's you should never be complacent with the argument. You, any response is appropriate. It can always get worse. So you, sh you should be careful with that mindset. Uh, we should just do something. But that's not always the right solution. Okay, but but I mean, with Rob Hirschhoff, in his defense, he's got business expertise, and sometimes South Africa does need that. Um, we la really lack people that just get on with things and, and create companies and stuff. I'm not sure what his investments are doing in South Africa, but hopefully that sort of helps a bit. Yeah, well, I think the great thing about him is that, one, um, he's a white person that's speaking out, and not necessarily just because a white person's weight um, voice carries more weight because so we, we but, just spoke about COVID. Now you're mentioning white. I mean, this show is cancelled. <laughs> but no, no, the the point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of white people that are frightened of the argument that you're a racist because you're speaking out. And just getting white people like um, Rob Hirschhoff and uh, what's his name Ian Cameron to speak out just gives confidence to white people to speak out more in general because everyone needs to speak out it doesn't matter if you're black white indian colored in south africa yeah. you need to speak out well there, there has been i mean i don't know how old you are now um i think you're a bit younger than me but there has there was a um period in south africa where the whites just did what the east the west germans did after world war ii they just went on went into business and they said we're going to keep quiet and leave politics because everyone's hating us anyway so you know we keep quiet mm. and then slowly but surely um, I think they're starting to reassert themselves in politics. I think they have already with Afri Forum and even the DA to some extent. Yeah. But I, I think it's re reached a point where you literally you can't keep silent anymore. I mean, you have to say something. This this cannot go. This, I mean, just electricity, ESCOM. I mean, we, we literally had stage six load shedding and up to some days we had almost no electricity. I mean, this is not sustainable. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, sustainable is another one of those words that annoy me, by the way. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, back... in the actual meaning of the word, ESCOM is, I mean, it's it's just tragic. I mean, and it's it's not, you know, a lack of call. It's not even a lack of expertise. It's just complete incompetence managing the thing to the ground. What's, what's incredible is um, I spent this um, winter holidays with some ESCOM employees, some top people working for ESCOM, a procurement officer that's been there for like 37 years. And he says that a manager at one of these uh, power plant stations like Badupi, they earn 2.5 million rand. And, and you're going to say a year? No, no, no. They earn 2.5 million rand a month. A month. So they earn 30 million rand a year. A manager. I, 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 I don't. I don't mind them earning that if we have electricity, you know. But <laughs> okay, I don't know if I agree with that. But if yeah, if we can reduce the salary and get the electricity, hopefully. But yeah. I mean, it's 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 what's incredible is this. Um, the the deputy chief of ESCOM called this one of these managers that earned these incredible salaries when one of these stations was were imploding. And the person didn't answer his call. I mean, this guy's earning like 30 well, million rand. I mean, why should yeah, he I mean, be? Or he's probably well, taking a midtime nap. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, no, it's, it's absurd. I mean, um, and, and, and I mean, the problem we have, I mean, energy, I've, I've, I've written a bit on this as well. Um, 
we are i mean south africa it's just tragic south africa state of affairs i mean because to fix the problem it's not going to happen overnight either i mean power stations take time to build you know so we can theoretically put some wind and solar in but i'm very skeptical if they can provide the necessary energy that you really need for a country and for that you need nuclear or coal and that's going to take ages to build so even if we want to we make the right decisions now which we aren't it's going to take 10 years at least to get it out so add 10 years to your life and that's probably the more realistic time when south africa will get out of the energy crisis which is never have you heard of this idea of i can't remember the term but of small nuclear reactors yeah, a small I modular think. reactor yeah yes i did part of my master's degree on it yeah um no it's so good um it, it a pro, i mean south africa was one of the first countries to invent one to, to, to develop one which was the pebble bed it was german technology we like to pretend it's ours it came from germany um but the um, problem with those things is i think today was was today or yesterday was the first time that they, the us approved the first design and it's been a problem with the nuclear energy for a very long time is that um, there's a lot of good ideas on paper, but nobody gets to build it. Nobody comes with a proper design so the regulator can approve it and we can build it and then have a learning curve and see how much it's going to cost. Because the big critique against nuclear has been that it takes too long to build it. Hinkley Point in the UK is 15 years. It's five years over budget and two billion or something over budget. And they don't get it. They don't finish it. Where in France in the 1980s, they built a power station every four to five years. So what happened? Well, you know, regulators came in and people just forgot how to build them. So at the moment, the only countries that can really build them efficiently is um, Russia and, and Korea, I think, and China. China. But, you know, that's geopolitically not feasible. Maybe Korea is still okay, but I don't think Russia and China is, is going to be acceptable. Um, can't we get these people to build them in South Africa? Well, the, the the Korean one that is built in Dubai at the moment that provides, I think, 25% of Dubai's energy, of the UAE's energy, is built by South Africans that are on site. So it's our engineers. They, I think it was managed by a South African at one stage. Most of the people on the, on, a, on the building site were South Africans trained in South Africa. So, yeah, there's nothing wrong with having the skills. I mean, our engineers can build and can fix Dubai's energy problems, but they can't do it in South Africa. That's the, <laughs> that's the failure of policy. Hmm. Yeah, no, I struggle to understand because load shedding hits the, the poor. I mean, it hits the poor the hardest. I've because I mean, to a certain degree, a, a middle class to rich person can buy something like a battery or can can buy practical stuff just like candles. I mean, a poor person can't can't even buy candles. So I mean, it, well, it, low solar panels South Africa have got feet, so you can get them cheap maybe at a, a second hand store. Yeah, you know, or, or you can steal them. But um, or you can steal the power cables. Like there's, there's generally a problem in South Africa of people stealing power cables. It's like an entire mafia. I mean, uh, this entire book. About I, I, I tried to explain that to Europeans. They couldn't understand why somebody would steal a water meter. And I said to them, "Well, there's copper apparently in the lining. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they just they, they just blew their mind. They couldn't understand it because I mean, my father was phoning me one day and he's like, he was just furious. It's like, you know, somebody stole the water meter. And then the guys <laughs> in Europe's like, this guy's crazy. Like why would somebody steal a water meter? I'm like, I don't know, but they stole it. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, Salim Wing, who has done some of the interviews on Worldview, is based in Switzerland. And perhaps you two should, should meet each other. He has mm -hmm. said that um, he, he tried to explain to people in Switzerland about a pothole and they can't they can't understand the concept of a pothole, like a hole in the road. <laughs> like that's that's all we know in South Africa and some places like the Free State, where you literally, you're, you're driving like this. It's like an adventure ride, but... In Switzerland, they don't even understand the concept of a pothole. Yeah, and it's, yeah, but it's in those mountains. But remember, in Switzerland, everything works. That's the difference. And they, they, don't, they don't understand the world where things don't work. Mm. You know, it's just not. In France, you'll find a little bit of them. It's not. I mean, in the countryside, generally the infrastructure is good, but it's also a bigger country than Switzerland. So there is still some issues with delivering things. But yeah, um, coming back to Rob Hirsoff, I like the guy. I like what he's doing and I, I i admire that business people like him are speaking out i mean in the interview you mentioned a few business people that are not speaking out i think he mentioned like a chairman of a bank in the united kingdom i can't remember the name but there's definitely we need more people to speak out uh, well, the, 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 thing, the thing we need as well and i think this is starting is a uh, different media i mean the south african media is so I mean, I don't even know what, what the correct word is to describe the Daily Maverick and those, you know, 
purely establishment type of media, News 24. They're just so uncritical, so it's so dumbed down. And I think with things like Biz News, for example, it's getting a little bit better that there is a critical media against the government. And um, there's been no government really that can withstand media pressure over long periods of time. And um, that will probably force the change. Mm. Yeah, no, we definitely need an alternative media source site in South Africa. Um, and what we're trying to do on Worldview is we're trying to combine entertainment with serious topics. I mean, we're not trying, just trying to, I mean, if you, if you, I mean, <laughs> I guess they've, they've terminated the YouTube channel, but you'll find a video on eSports where I hosted a Cape Independence debate with a few, um, like Ibrahim Rasul, the, the former premier of the ANC and the West Cape, uh, Fakey Mentor of the Action SA, Te um, Benedicta van Minnen, mm. she's so the member of parliament for the DA, uh, Cornei Mulder from the Freedom Front Plus, and Phil Craig from the Cape Independence Advocacy Group. And what we did in that debate is they delivered their opinions, and then I would walk around in the audience and I'd ask their opinions as well. And it, it becomes a sort of an entertaining like a great debate situation and you can imagine a younger audience getting attracted to these sort of things <laughs> because you, you you have to be careful of just preaching and getting that same audience over and over again you need to find a way to get to attract to um make serious to topics attractable to the average person like a younger audience and that's you do that by a, a, deb a debate like 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 i hosted there so you, you you've been going because I, I saw your i guess i can call it public debate a public uh, interview with nick hudson so you're doing you're going to do more of that in the future as well as opposed to just the youtube sort of face-to-face -face streaming yeah yeah definitely definitely and we're, we're more and more prioritizing um a debate and with a lot of we want to get like bigger and bigger audiences and get the audience involved because the great thing about an audience is they have that sort of uh pol they don't have the political correctness filter i mean and in the debate i mean it's very entertaining uh, unless you choose your audience for you you get this yeah yeah but definitely definitely but i mean in the debate you heard it's amazing um literally there were two people engineers who literally the one guy just cocked the da out from an angle he just he, he saw his opportunity and the DA member of parliament is sitting right next to him. And he just, what the fuck are you people doing? I mean, you just went after this lady. <laughs> he literally tapped her shoulder while he was doing that. I mean, the other guy went after the ANC. I mean, th this is like entertainment worthy. This is like what people want to see. They don't want politicians to give this textbook deliverance i mean this the the audience member that's just goes after a person that's entertaining but but do you think that we're giving the politicians too much of a hard time or not uh not not the anc <laughs> they they definitely they need a harder time well, and you, i think you know with, with, the, with the anc i mean when i was speaking to, to richard sakwan on on russia I mean, he's, he's very informed in Russia, but not in South Africa. And he said to me, what was so amazing about South Africa is how well the country worked after 1994. And I was like, I was trying to keep the face to keep the conversation in Russia. I'm like, this is not what happened, you know. So, yeah, they, the ANC, unfortunately, still has this internationalist propaganda against going for this great story. And, um, there's, there's been some people criticizing it, but um, not enough, not nearly enough. Yeah, the the problem is that sort of the criticism is driven by uh, organizations like AfriForum, and AfriForum has been discredited to a large extent. It's just um, if you just focus on farm murders alone, and so because you're, you're not you're not, a, you're not um, uh, an advocate for AfriForum, or what what's your view on them? No, no, no. I think AfriForum is great. I think I I just think their credibility around the world is not that great, and the countries like the United States, or more specifically. Um, news outlets like the New York Times and what they, it's easy to discredit Afri Forum. But if I mean, if you instead of focusing on farm murders, if you just talk about load shedding, that most people in South Africa don't have access to electricity on a daily basis, that will get the sympathy of, of a lot of people. I mean, if, it, might, it just, might also give foreign aid to the ANC and you know, keep them in power for longer. So you must be careful. Yeah, that's that's also the problem. I mean, a lot of these international companies just think, if, okay, we'll, we'll send them money and we'll send money to African states. All you're doing is you're propping up dictators, um, either literally or figure, I mean, the ANC for all intents and purposes is like a dictatorship 
where they mm-hmm. basically control the townships. I mean, if you don't vote for the ANC in the townships, they know who you are. I mean, I've spoken to people in the townships that it's not easy to vote against the ANC and continue well, they, they, use, they use intimidation tactics and uh, beat them and things of that sort. Yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, that's that's been going on for a long time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, back before 1994, they the, the necklace murders, where they put the, the the tire around your around your neck, and they it was filled with petrol, and they lit it on fire. I mean, that was a horrific way to die. And yeah, uh, well, that, that was the, the the idea that they should use violence to overthrow the system, and I think that came to bite them in the end of the day. That the biggest failure to me, by the way, was the fact that they took their fight to their schools. You know, liberation before education. Well. That set South Africa back 30 years, and still so we're still paying a price for that. Yeah, no, education is yeah, and say I mean, the 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 power of organizations like I think it's SATU, the South African Teachers Unions. Are, you can literally not fire a teacher or a or a, a principal if you're a member of SATU. It's incredible the influence that organization has over South African institutions. No, no, but I mean, it's the union culture as well. I mean, that's it's it, it's at the heart of ESCOM as well. I mean, they just they try and intimidate and they they vandalize and they the politicians are scared of them as opposed to standing up to them. But I think if the politicians do stand up, they're going to come for the politicians. So they say we'd rather not do it. Well, I've, I don't think these these unions have that much power mm-hmm. than people think. I think it's it's I, I think to be honest, it's mainly ideology that's keeping these unions alive from the politician side. I don't think, yeah, I, that's my personal opinion. I don't really have anything to base that on, but I don't. But, I really don't what, think this what, union... What, what, I mean, I, I saw you spoke to, to Chris Malan not too long ago about ideology and stuff. And I'd like to get your view on that as well, because I, that's also something that has always fascinated me, is how certain type of arguments show up all the time, you know, in political discourse. And they don't really make rational sense, but they sort of follow as a storyline from each other. So yeah, your, your view, like on the on the ANC's propaganda, uh, on the on the ideology, like why why do they stick to it? Well, I think it was basically because of, and, and I mean, you also get this from the doctor, the inter- interview with Doctor Anthea Jeffrey, who has done a lot of research on this. They get it basically from the indoctrination they received in um, these camps outside of South Africa. It's, I mean, if you're, I mean, Salim Wang has also said this, and he's spoken to a lot of ANC members and former ANC members. Once you've been born and bred with within the ANC, you do not leave that organization. It's, it's, it's so, no, it's a cult. It's it, these, the ANC gave them a home overseas. They gave them something to live for. Many of these students were driven out during the Soweto uprisings. And these people cannot live without this. I mean, I mean Franz Cronier, who I've opened, even, I've also spoken to, said it the best. I told him, how is it possible that a person like Rob Davis can't realize, the former Minister of Trade and Industry in South Africa, can't realize what's going wrong in South Africa? I mean, you can see the lights aren't working. You can see, it, I mean, it's not, it's not like it's indirect. The lights aren't working. It's in front of you. You need yeah. to try something else. And, and he said that you have to realize what a tr- transition these people have to go through to realize everything they've stood for their entire life has been wrong. They've fight, they fought for this for 50, 60 years, and now they, they have, you, you have to convince them that they've been wrong. It's, I mean, well, it's the it, sunk cost it, fallacy. You can't convince these people that they've been I, I wrong. See, I life. see something very similar with the environmental movement in, in Europe. Um, I mean, there's been so many apocalyptic predictions of the environment that's just plain flat out wrong. Um, you know, overpopulation was a myth. It, it never came, as an example. Um, we're never going to run out of resources. You know, there's a lot of like X, Y, Z. And yet they still hang on to the same, you know, idea that is man that is destroying the environment. And therefore, we must check your footprint and do all these, you know, religious like things. And when you talk to somebody that has changed their minds on this, it's like they went through a nervous breakdown. And I, I think that is where the ANC is heading. I think a guy like Mantashi one day is going to be a born again free marketeer. You know, he's just going to he's going to crash down and he's going to come back and he's going to deregulate the market or he'll be out of power. What is your opinion of um, Elon Musk's uh, tweet? I don't I don't know if you saw the tweet. Oh, he's, he said well, that... um, he's wrong on the overpopulation also being a problem, but he's correct in on uh, um, oh, he's, he's he's wrong on like he's right and wrong. So he's right that 
overpopulation isn't the problem. But it's wrong that underpopulation is a problem as well. I mean, if you look at the uh, human population growth, it follows a logistics curve or a normal distribution. Okay? Cumul uh, the, if you sum a normal distribution, you get the S-curve, basically. Um, and if you look at the first 16%, that is usually of population growth. That is usually where... Um, yeah, what is the first the first sigma of sigma two sigma three so if you take yeah you know, once two standard deviations from the mean um that is usually when populations start urbanizing one standard deviation from the mean is the first generation and then afterwards you at your peak so basically as people when you're working in the countryside uh, where you live in a countryside you tend to have six children because most of them die and then you have two of them to take care of you when you're old but as you migrate to cities people still have the habits of breeding like rabbits. So the first generation has six or seven children and the second and third afterwards will have one or two. And that's been observed throughout every population in human history. So if you look at European um, statistics and, and Americans, they've basically stabilized their population. China has, is starting to lose their population now. So is India, they're starting to inflect. And Africa, I think at the end of the century will be as big as Asia. Africa is the last place to urbanize and it's urbanizing at a rapid, at rapid place. That's also why I'm a bit more optimistic about Africa because urban um, populations tend to be less tribal and behave completely differently than those from the countryside. Um, but either way, overpopulation is, is just not an issue. Um, so underpopulation that Elon Musk is scared of is that if we start losing people, who's going to do all the jobs? Now, if you look at Japan, that's a very good example. Japan has maintained the same economic growth, which is very zero, but they've decreased their population. So per person, they got richer. So it's also not an issue. You know, so he's, he, I think it's just he doesn't know how to use a condom, so he's trying to justify his, his actions. But what do you say to those who say it's sort of a racist argument that you're, you're concerned about um, the wrong people not populating enough? Well, right? there's, a, there's a factual basis for that. I'm not sure how racist it is, but it's a factual argument to say you're concerned about the wrong people. So um, if you look at the most densely populated places in the world, it's all Europe and North America. Okay, um, some European cities are still more, I think Malta is more populated than Shanghai, for example. Um, but whatever it is, it's, uh, um, Africa only has two cities in the mega cities of the world, which is Cairo and Johannesburg, Pretoria. And I think Lagos might now be. So it might be three cities in the mega cities in the world. Most of the top 100 mega cities are not in Africa. So um, to say that Africa is overpopulated is just false. Africa is sparsely, is sparsely populated, and that's why it is poor. One of the richest in places. Namibia. I mean, the, nobody is in Namibia. So I think that the one of the worst places is Mauritania. It's a desert. You know, who wants to stay there, anyways? But um, if you look at densely populated places like the Netherlands, it's some of the richest places in the world. And when I, I got into um, reading on city planning, um, the interesting fact to me was in Shanghai. Shanghai was dense, more densely populated during um, the, it's the communist era than it is today. And one reason is after the city starts um, developing, people start sprawling to the suburbs. So um, Shanghai is, is moving to a post-industrial city as well. So, you know, it's, 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 an, it's a phony issue. And attached to that is all these environmental issues. But, you know, people like that don't deal in the facts. Yeah, what's frustrating to me about the, yeah, of course, Milan and I agree with him that um, you should refrain from using these terms like climate change or um, climate change denialism or vaxxer or anti-vaxxer, you should refrain from using those words because immediately people put you in a camp. Yeah. So you, sh you should use more, um, you should literally just use anything else to describe your, your point of view. And so, for example, 99% of, I think, of people in the world would say, um, we want a clean environment. Obviously, we don't want um, pollution. Obviously, we don't want um, cows farting in our neighborhoods or whatever. But you, you want everything done in a practical sense. I mean, you don't want everyone to lose their jobs. I mean, that's probably the viewpoint of 99% of the people in the world. You want everything done in a practical sense that um, in your in your pursuit of achieving like no pollution or no cows farting or whatever, that everyone just doesn't lose their job. So what's frustrating to me is, when it comes to this entire issue is what is the end goal? What What is people so afraid uh, of? I mean, the, well, what's going to happen? Death. I mean, they're scared of their own death fundamentally. Yeah, I mean, that's possible. But I mean, just practically, I mean, I think people are so attached to a movie like um, what's what's the movie called? The Day After Tomorrow, where they literally believe 
uh, one day there's going to be this massive tsunami if, if we don't stop climate change we're all going to drown i mean and al gore has also propagated this really showed that um in that in do documentary in the inconvenient truth he conveniently showed footage of new york rising the, the water levels rising but obviously that's over time if even even yeah. if that were true it's over time it's not one day well, you're gonna I, I, I mean up. yes the, do you know what the rate of sea level rise is worldwide on average well, what's like, that well, well, how, okay, just case how, how much how many millimeters what's... or meters per year does the sea rise no fuck i know no, I, I i honestly i wouldn't i would probably guess sorry, at the wrong. moment it's one millimeter okay and in the last decade okay it was 1.5 millimeters so that's the 50 percent increase in sea level rise okay that's if you can actually measure that accurately so by the end of the century, the ocean is going to rise according to UN data. If you actually read the report, which nobody does, it's not that scary. Um, the, it's something like 300 millimeters, this ocean is going to rise. It's like this, you know. That's the, the catastrophic sea level rise from climate change. So you can run away, you can walk away from that. Mm. You know? yeah. Or you can literally just stay on the same spot and just, I don't know, build your house a little higher. I mean, I mean, the Dutch has been, have been building burns around the city for a very long time. There's, there's no mm -hmm. way, reason why we can't do that. I'm sure, I mean, Cape Town has reclaimed land from the sea. The Cape, for the Cape Fats is now, it used to be, you know, water. So we can just continue doing that for a few more meters and we're there. Mm. You know, so so I, I, there's, no, there's no massive panic. It's just, and I checked the, the stats the other day on um, climate refugees. It's a remarkable zero. There's so far absolutely zero people who have fled their home because of climate disruptions. You know, you wouldn't hear that if you... And that's according to the UN's own data. <laughs> you know, they've, they've been trying wow. to blame the Syrian civil war on climate change. It's not true. It's yeah. because of war. Obama. Obama, Obama yeah. blamed it on climate change and... Yeah, well, never it, mind, it, um, Shabir, uh, what's his name? Uh, what's uh, Al-Assad? Um, I mean, poisoning yeah, his Russia, people. Russia, or... yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, that's one reason. The other reason is that the U.S. bombed the country to hell and then people fled. You know, if you bomb a country, people tend to flee. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I mean, I'm getting back to the apocalypse. I, I don't see any of the apocalyptic predictions becoming true, but the people want to believe in the end of the world. And I think that's sort of where, you know, it, it, uh, this is going. And it's sort of the ANC as well. It's not that okay, they don't believe in the end of the world, but they believe in a utopian national democratic revolution or whatever the hell they believe in um you know some there's some utopian idea and any fact that deviates from that vision is just discredited in the narrative and you you raised a very interesting point Ihu, of we said fear of death I, I definitely agree with that that because of the fear of death there's this sort of tendency towards a religion of some kind people want something to keep them comfortable because i mean if you think about it the game of life is extremely horrifying i mean the fact that you can die i mean you, you can plan everything and walk outside your door and a, a piano can fall on you i mean it, oh, it's yeah. a, it's horrifying if you think about it and people want something outside of themselves to believe in the communism um, christianity or whatever um so i don't know if you've watched before example a debate between um, sam harris and jordan peterson there were these debates. I, I, I tend to be one of the few people who can, few people who cannot stand Jordan Peterson. So, yeah, to be honest, I can't either. I mean, I think he's I, I, I think a he's a, I think he's a cult hero. But yeah, then, well, I, I think he struggles to get to the point. I mean, it's really I've I've, I've more respect for Sam Harris um, than I have to for okay. Jordan Peterson. But no, I, I really... didn't see that one, but yeah. But I... but, but, but but what's interesting in these debates is that. They made two very absolute arguments. Jordan Peterson made the argument that because of the fall of religion, we had the rise of Nazism, right, um, and the rise of communism. And Sam Harris said, uh, atheist said, these are just religions in another form. And I think there's sort of a middle way between both of these arguments. People wanted to believe something else, but if the religions weren't that's uh, sort of an argument there's there's a lesser of two evils and a christianity to be an evangelical christian is is much better to be a communist if, for, just take for example if, if julius malema was a evangelical christian instead of a communist or if he was a if he was a, a he was addicted to gaming right it, it, it would be a much better situation for south africa so there's sort of a, some things 
to be addicted or to believe in an afterlife or to i don't know to commit yourself it's better is, is, than... isn't julius Mema supposed to be a christian or something he's doesn't he didn't he go and pray at one of those churches yeah, I have no idea. Well, I think one day is for open immigration, the next day is not. So I mean, the sky is all over the place. But he's but, for free. He's for free visa access to Spain. I'm sure of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. and for free vodka access in Spain. Um, but but sort of the the argument is that, yeah, I I think um, there's definitely some things that are worse than others, some religions that are worse than others. I think Christopher Hitchens has said that, for example, Islam is worse than Christianity at this very moment. And yeah, so I, I just wanted to make sure this video really gets banned. So that's oh. why I mentioned Islam. No, I'm joking. Yeah, but... yeah, well, although Christopher Hitchens, I wasn't very... Imp I, I mean, he, he had some things to say that was true, but he was also a bit of an ideologue for war at the end of the day. I mean, he basically tried to justify the Iraq war. Um, and what I never understood is that the people, the Iraq war was, um, I mean, when George Bush invaded Iraq, he read from the book of Jeremiah, you know, so uh, fundamental, cr fundamentalist Christian in, Christians in America was also heavily mobilized for the Iraq war. And that part, uh, Christopher Hitchens was very, um, I mean, hesitant to criticize, you know, he criticized Christianity, but not for the war stance that he supported, because he supported the war. Yeah, no, I think war is a very dangerous situation in general because there's almost never really, I mean, people like to think that's the case, but there's never really a bad guy or a good guy. I mean, just take Ukraine and Russia, for example. It's just a question well, you, of... You need to support of, Ukraine. That's part of the... To get new, to, to, yeah, to, to you, have to, stay, yeah. you have to update your Facebook status to include a Ukrainian flag and all that crap, because, I mean... Yeah, and, yeah. and, and it's... it's, it's what well, The interesting thing about the Ukraine war, though, is um, it's the first time that we are being presented with propaganda on both sides. And I'm still faced with people who would tell me that, um, yeah, the West doesn't use propaganda. It's only Russian propaganda. And I'm like, what, what have you seen in the last few months on Twitter? I mean, yeah. how many, the ghost of Kiev, for example, that was complete rubbish. You know, yeah. you, you actually have a good insight now as to both sides using propaganda. And yet people still falling for, for their own propaganda because they love it. Hmm. What do you think of the Russian argument that Russians are being oppressed in the Ukraine? That's why they needed to invade. Well, that doesn't justify the invasion. I mean, but you can endorse both. And you see, this is the problem with propaganda. Propaganda has truth in it. Um, it was true that the Ukrainian government was enormously racist against the Russian minority. It is true that they banned the Russian language, for example. There's not a single Russian school and uh, university in Ukraine that you can teach in Russian anymore. Okay, despite the Russian being spoken by 20% of the population. So obviously you can see how that would antagonize the Russian speaking minority. Um, also, um, you know, there was the, the Ukrainian government never adhered to the Minsk, II, the Minsk II protocol that was signed. So did Russia, by the way, never adhered to that and neither did the United States. But that would have given those federalists, they were not separatists, they were federalists in the eastern side of Ukraine. That would have given them a federal, um, uh, 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 they would stay Ukrainians, but they'll have a federal province, two of them. And they would have Russian as the official language there. And that is what the agreement wanted. Because there's different types of Russians there, if I can put it that way. You have those in the Donbass area who identify as Ukrainian, but they speak Russian. So they won't say I'm Russian, they say I'm Ukrainian. But then you have those in Crimea being an exceptional case, where the Crimeans tell you, listen, I'm Russian. And there's just no way, no two ways about it. So there's lots of nuance about it. And then you have, when I spoke to Ivan Kachanovsky, who studied the Maidan massacres, he said to me, you must be careful, those in, in Odessa, they have a different historical identity as well. So he, his argument was it comes down to history. Different parts of Ukraine was integrated into the bigger Ukraine at different periods in time. And every area has sort of a different narrative. So there's a lot more complexity to the situation. And then there's a Hungarian minority as well. And I don't know if you know uh, Viktor Orban last year. He gave a speech where he was invoking the Treaty of Trianon, which was the equivalent of the Treaty of Versailles to Hungary that broke up the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, Hitler actually used the Treaty of Trianon to try and occupy the, the, the Sudetenland. Orban was invoking this to get back the historical lands, such as Transylvania in um, Romania. And I forgot the Ukrainian name, it's Trans something. But there's a Hungarian speaking minority, it's 100,000 or so in Ukraine. And so Hungary's got interest there. And then you have the Poles with their own interests. So the problem I have with this war is 
yes, um, there's no justification for Putin invading. Okay, but the longer we let it uh, continue, the more we are going to mobilize other nationalisms in the area, and nobody wants that type of nationalism coming back to Europe. I mean. Uh, and so you need to end this as quickly as possible. And to do that, you need to negotiate with Putin. Now, if you say you want to negotiate with Putin, they say you're Neville Chamberlain. You know, Putin is Hitler and you cannot negotiate with Hitler. Well, first of all, that's factually not true. And also they forget even the Munich Peace Conference did bring a peace agreement to the, to the Sudetenland. Um, short-lived peaceful agreement, but nonetheless there was one. So they don't even know the basis of that of of what Chamberlain tried to achieve. So I, I look at the whole area and I say um, there's a lot of hypocrisy to that war, and I wish that um, people would you know at least know a little bit of history of what occurred there since 2014 at least before they start um, jumping only on the pro-Ukrainian or pro-Russian side. Yeah, I mean. I've spoken to Dr. Stephen Davis, he's a historian there and the UK mm -hmm. libertarian. And he has also said that, I mean, this entire idea of a Ukraine is sort of a new idea. It's sort of a nationalist, a weird nationalist idea that's been cobbled together by the Soviets. I mean, they, they gave the Ukrainians more power. So in, in the um, aftermath of the revolution to... To placate yes and no. Them. I mean, there, there was, um, you must, again, it depends which part of Ukraine. So if you look at Western Ukraine, for example, um, they've had a Ukrainian identity going back centuries. Um, that They are the most nationalistic pro-Ukraine. The thing that happened after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, is much like the decolonization of Africa, it invoked certain nationalisms that were pre-existent. I mean, the Europeans did not create nationalism in Africa. Tribalism existed as long as humans have been there. But obviously, during the decolonization period, those nationalisms became assertive, like in Angola, for example, where it broke out into civil war. Now, what happened when the um, Soviet states um, broke apart was that many of these minorities who were oppressed of by Russia had a certain nationalistic narrative. But in those areas, they were Russian-speaking minorities. And a lot of um, uh, experts in geopolitics at the time was very scared of the Soviet Union breaking up for this reason, that it can be similar to what happened with Hitler in the Sudetenland. And one of the guys who did not want the Soviet Union to break up, who was very hesitant, was George Bush I. He was very scared of this, okay, which is an inconvenient fact for getting. His advisors were actually trying to keep the Commonwealth of Independent Nations together until they saw it was going to collapse, and then they supported the, the movements that came out of it. Um, but if you look, for example, at um, Estonia, Estonia is a Russian-speaking minority. And when they got independence, they made a rule where they said... Um, you can only become Estonian. Um, it's the only identity. And then the Russians protested. And then they said, okay, you can become Estonian if you know 500 Estonian words. Okay, and that was sort of, so the Russians had to read 500 words to become Estonians, but they still speak the language there. Um, in Ukraine, it was um, one of the best uh, uh, things that happened in Ukraine was when it uh, uh, broke apart, it was the one of the few places that had a, a, a bigger nationalism that included the Russians as well. But after 2014, it took an ugly turn, and that tried to exclude the Russian minorities from the global polity. And that's where the antagonism comes from. So there's, there's a lot of finger pointing there at the moment. Um, you know, what we can say now is the war started, you need to end it. And then obviously, if there's going to be some kind of settlement, it must be based in political realism, meaning the Russians exist in Ukraine. 20% of your country speaks Russian, whether you like it or not. They've been there for ages. Either you're going to accept them federally, or maybe they should have a referendum on independence, um, which I think is what Putin is enforcing, which I don't think is right either because it's going to break families apart. Um, the, the problems, I, I've spoken to, for example, the Ukrainian ambassador, and mm. she said, okay, well, I, I don't know how much authority the, the Ukrainian ambassador to South Africa has, but um, she has said that the, the entire idea of that party, eastern part of Ukrainian breaking apart, is a non-starter. It's not going to happen. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, she would say, I, I would not like to see Ukraine break apart, as I say, because um, first of all, it is, uh, it's, it's just going to invoke a lot of more problems. But at the moment, if we continue the war, um, and we continue to fund to fight Russia till the last Ukrainian is dead. That's going to happen. That's what Putin will achieve. So we have to have some negotiation with them. But now I know the Ukrainians don't want to negotiate because the Russians are the invaders. And I've been hearing this for a few months now that people have been telling me, look, 
Um, if somebody invades your country, you don't negotiate with them. It's Hitler. You don't negotiate with Hitler. Well, I'm saying the alternative to that is, let's assume Ukraine defeats Russia. Nothing stops Putin from shooting a hell of a lot of rockets into Ukraine, destroying the entire Ukraine. And there's four nuclear reactors the size of uh, the type of Chernobyl there that can easily be, dis be destroyed by military missiles. So, you know, there is a balancing scale, here, unfortunately. Hmm. Yeah, what's frustrating to me is when people sell this argument that, oh, I mean, the Russians invading the Ukraine is like invading the United States. Not like the United States is a perfect country, but I mean, like the Ukrainians, the Ukrainian government is this uh, absolute non-corrupt, free, democratic society. I mean, what what kind of nonsense is that? I think literally in terms of world standards, Ukrainians, the Ukrainian government is as corrupt as the Russian government or not more. I mean... Yeah, I think they're they one level below Russia. Okay, so it's basically the same. It's Russia's little brother in many ways. Yeah, um, I mean, it's 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 sort of a it's a argument of relativism. I mean, it, you can't say that the Ukrainians are they're the fighters of freedom and they're libertarians and they you know, no, they they, they're, they're not. But look, on the other hand, it is a country being invaded, so you need yeah. to you need to accept that if somebody invades a country, um, young men especially is going to take up arms and defend it, right? So, and the other thing is, yes, okay, NATO expansionism probably provoked Russia, but Ukraine also has its own security interest. So it has to balance NATO against Russia. And this is what Richard Sokwa said to me is the, in the, since 2014, we've seen a series of incompetent statesmanship from the Ukrainian leaders in trying to antagonize the situation. I mean, you had Ukrainians uh, making outright racist comments against the Russian minority. So what do you think was going to happen? What, do you, what did NATO think was going to happen when they're going to flood arms and weapons into that area? I don't think anyone's thought anything. I think it was just the military seeing a new market for their for their arms, and I don't think anyone expected Putin to invade. And now the invasion started, and now, you know, NATO is not coming to the protection of Ukraine. Nobody, nobody in Europe seriously wants to engage Russia into a war because they know what that would cost. But some have also said that the Americans provoked the situation by pursuing this idea that Ukraine can join NATO, even though that was really a non-starter. They weren't really well, going to make that happen. Yes and no, but remember, uh, strategic ambiguity is a, is a, a tool of foreign relations. Um, so America has strategic ambiguity towards Taiwan. It doesn't formally recognize Taiwan. It does not formally say it will come to the defense of Taiwan, but it has a missile carry, uh, 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 um, I think a missile, uh, what do you call it? The thing that carry the planes, um, aircraft carrier between mm. Taiwan and China. And it keeps it that way deliberately because it knows if it formally recognizes Taiwan, there will be war. But if it says, look, Taiwan is part of China, then it becomes part of China. So it sort of keeps this gray area open. And I think that was the game they were trying to play with Ukraine. But the guys who I blame for Ukraine, though, is people like John McCain, who was going to Ukraine and promising the militias um, congressional support if they go on the offensive. That's his word against Russia. That was 2014. Isn't uh, also the senator from um, South Carolina, what's his name? Lindsey Graham? Uh, Lindsey Graham, yeah, the two of them were there. The, you know, and, and he, he's a complete idiot. So, you, you know, if you do that on, on Russia's borders, um, you should expect a response. So that was the idiocy that was going on. And then also, 2014 was a coup d'etat. And very few people would like to admit that the Ukrainian far right in particular staged a coup d'etat on Maidan where they shot almost 200 innocent people dead. And the idea was we need to shoot as many people and then blame it on the government. And they overthrew a pro-Russian government who was democratically elected. Um, fortunately, the Ukrainian population democratically voted and got rid of the, some of the far right elements. But some of them still stayed into the security forces um, so, you know, and, and have some, some positions of authority there. So there's also not nothing to the neo-Nazi element. You know, you see, this is the problem with propaganda. Propaganda does not want an argument. It just speaks in absolutes, you know. Ukraine is, is Nazi. It's only NATO expansionism. That's the Russian story. Well, some of there is some truth to all of this. But uh, as soon as you try and discuss it, they will accuse you of sympathizing for either, for either side of the story. Yeah, and coming back to um, the discussion I had with Chris Milan, you have to find a way where you stop using words that immediately throw you in a camp. I mean, that's literally, I mean, it, it sounds stupid, but that's literally how they get you.
if you, the, 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 the moment you use a word mm. that's often used uh, in a propaganda circles on the media, you're thrown in, okay, you're pro-Russian or you're pro-Ukrainian. And you've, you've literally, you have to construct your sentences deliberately in a way that navigates through that, where you say that, for example, you're for world peace or uh, things that everyone agrees with. You're, you're for a sensible no. solution to the conflict. So, or So, so yeah, that's the thing with the to the Ukraine area is I would like to see the war come to an end. And one reason why I'm quite close to this issue, um, at my wedding, there were many Russians. And I've lived here, there's a lot of Ukrainians where I stay in Paris. So I actually know these people. And they are intermarried, some of them. You know, they, they, they've got families that are being torn apart. I had one friend who dated a, a Ukrainian girl in 2000 and, 2014 or 15 was when Putin annexed Crimea. And that split their relationship in part. That was like the end of the <laughs> end of discussion. That's how big the, wow. these fights are. Um, so, you know, um, you have all these issues. Um, uh, and if you go to the Ukrainian church, for example, in Paris, they were praying in both Russian and Ukrainian to end the war. So, you know, those things are not coming out. That the average person wants to end this conflict because they're not winning anything. Uh, Ukraine is depopulating at the moment. I think they've lost something like uh, 5 million people already. And their population is back to 1930s or 40s levels. And most people, when they immigrate, they don't come back. So even if you want to rebuild the country, after you've killed a lot of young people, how are you going to do that? So, you know, all these, none of these questions are being asked. And that, that's what's frustrating me about the whole discussion. It's just be a, um, the only thing on NATO and the European Union's mind at this stage is we need to defeat Russia because Putin invaded. And we don't, you know, any sign of negotiation is interpreted as a sign of weakness. And that's mm. sort of the, the narrative that needs to be broken. Mm. No, definitely. But I mean, Echo, I mean, our problems are going to be solved. I mean, uh, what's his name? Zelensky is appeared in the Vogue magazine. I mean, that's <laughs> that's going to solve. I mean, that's... Yeah, I, I don't know if I if I should criticize him because, I, I mean, I, I he's a president and he's being, the country is being invaded. But I mean, that, that was a PR failure. Whatever they no. wanted to achieve, that didn't work. Yeah. yeah, I don't understand that at all. Yeah. Anyways, uh, Donald, um, yeah, I, I sort of give you, uh, I think I've talked more than you tonight, um, to give you like a minute or so. What do you have? Um, maybe a few more. Uh, do you have anything else coming up that we can look forward to? And people have been asking, uh, where can they find you? Have they? Yeah, well, there's somebody who's asking, like, where can I find you now that Worldview has taken off? So, um, well, yeah. That's an ongoing situation. We're still in a discussion with a human. Oh, there, there we go, content. just to show I'm not making it up. Where is Worldview now? That's the <laughs> well, he has to wait, my <laughs> one viewer. Um, we, we're in discussion with um, a human from YouTube. And yeah, I hope he's not blowing us off because he promised to respond within 24 hours, but he hasn't. And when I asked him, he said, uh, because of COVID, ironically, I mean, because... Yeah. That's why China channel was removed because of COVID. We have less staff members, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I mean, COVID. That's that's that argument that doesn't hold weight anymore. I mean, really. But anyway, uh, either our channel can reinstate it. It's possible that it can be reinstated. But mm -hmm. otherwise, we're at the moment looking at merging with a YouTube channel called Nisport Afrikaans YouTube channel. They have sponsors. And you'll be able to find us there. The the host of Nisport, Isaac de Pussy, is very interested in the idea mm -hmm. because he'd like to have our support. Because just practically, if you want to create a media company, and, and, you can't. And you're not hosting Nick Hudson anymore. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's definitely, that will be a requirement. Um, but practically, if you want to create a sub, uh, government, uh, government, well, yeah, that's another discussion. But if you want to create a media company, um, you can't do it on your own. It's really, it's difficult. I mean, to... For yeah. sponsors to production and all this it's almost impossible to do it on your own so that's and one then, of the reasons when you you make a decision also do you want to do the interviews or do you want to run the company i guess at one stage yeah yeah no definitely um so yeah we we are trying to solve this issue we're trying we're actually having a discussion tomorrow with nisport the host there to find a common ground where we can merge and you're yeah we you're most likely going to see our videos popping up on nisport shortly um especially our cape independence debate which you don't definitely don't want to miss it was a lot of zingers and a lot of fire that flew during that debate and predictably the the opposite people said that the entire argument is racist that 
if you want to pursue Cape independence, it's yeah, it's it's funny how they literally coalesced around that argument, like faking Did you have from... any non-white people arguing for Cape independence? No. <laughs> okay, so they probably used that argument against you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You walk, you walked. They walked into that trap. I mean. Yeah, yeah. no, no, it's definitely true. Um, but like the Cape independence people have also pointed out, I mean, practically, it's really it really has to be white people driving dri driving this issue because you you can't have it both ways either you have to admit that colored people and black people are less well off than white people and because they're less well off they won't be able to have time to drive these issues or you have to admit that i mean somehow they're not they can participate well, I, I i look at my critique against them i'm not in favor of it first of all i come from the north of south africa okay i've never liked the cape and i would say global warming yeah. is great if cape town is underwater and i know you're in sea point so you'll probably be underwater um but you know my view is just as if i look at their own polls it does tell me there's a racial disparity in the support in the cape um and that is obvious and that's i think due to history i don't think it's just uh you know because they white would do this it's, it's historical narratives they interplay um so i i think they don't understand the complexity of disentangling the western cape from the greater south africa if they want to do that and to think that you can do that without having pain induced onto the domestic population i don't think that's going to work so they they're not being honest about what they propose you know but if the western cape tomorrow wants to vote to be independent i mean i, I honestly don't feel that strongly about it they can go yeah i i definitely i understand that argument i think it's sort of like Cornelia Mulder has also said from the Freights from Plus, you can you can pursue both. You can fight for a better South Africa and for an independent Western Cape. Um, the two are not mutually exclusive. And it's sort of you have to understand the argument for Cape independence is that, I mean, you have to admit that 2004, 2024 for South Africa is pretty much just a gamble. I mean, it can go either way. We don't know yeah. what the fuck's going to happen. I mean, we, it can be an ANC EFF coalition. It can be a coalition of the opposition parties. It can be totally chaos. It can and be another, can... An, another Ramaphosa moment. You know? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it can be like a 51% ANC. And then, I mean, it, the South African can't survive for another. So uh, Cape Independence will be difficult. But I mean, you have to keep everything in perspective. And compare that to what can happen in the rest of South Africa. So, I mean, like the Cape Independence people say, it's a, I mean, it's a matter of last resort, but that's the point we've reached. I mean, you have to consider these options that you try for well, this issue. I would ask, argue it's much more feasible for the Western Cape to become federal than independent at this stage. I think that's happening already. You know, people already taking responsibility for themselves and the area around them. And um, I think federalism is compatible with the South African constitution. We just, we've never enforced our federal laws, but it can evolve that way. So I, I would think that's a much better avenue. And I think it will ease the tensions um, because there's a lot of in and out of migration of the Cape. And, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, to me, it sounds a little bit too complicated to think you can just walk away from a political body that you've been part of since, I mean, how long has been the Union of South Africa, basically, you know? Almost hundred and something years. Well, well, you, I, I think you can achieve both. You can drive both, and um, yeah, I don't want to give too much away of what the Cape Independence people are planning, but they see federalism as sort of a Trojan horse for independence. So they're driving federalism in the aim of the Western Cape becoming so well off that people say, okay, but why are we still part of South Africa? So they're yeah, they're, they're driving the Democratic Alliance to finds credible solutions to federalism so that the, the people start arguing okay but we're, we're so well off why are we still part of south africa i think that's literally what happened in the case of scotland they used the threat of independence to gain more power and with the more power they the, the people started saying okay but why are we still but, part but at of the, the end UK? of the day the scots rejected independence yeah but the, the vote got closer and closer so i think the first vote the second vote was much more clear. I think it was like 46%. So you can clearly see the trajectory that if you achieve more federalism, the, the, the cause for independence grows. If, if, if there's a growing increase between Western Cape and the rest of South Africa, 
people start saying, okay, but why do we remain part of South Africa? Uh, I still think Pretoria is a much better place to live in than Cape Town, unfortunately. I, I think that, that yeah, I think, I mean, I've, I've been to Pretoria. My family lives in Pretoria, and I've, I, I think definitely. So, see, I, I believe that the future is global. It's, it's digital countries. I mean, people like Davi Ruud likes to say digital countries where we associate via um, cryptocurrencies and via like Facebook groups that just becomes more like a website where I say, okay, Many, many, many cults, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the, the Catholic Church had power in the medieval ages, where you, if you're part of the Catholic Church, even though you're in Lithuania or in France or whatever, you became part of the institution. That's the future. And I see either you, the Cape Independence is going to happen in the long term, or you can just let it happen now. It's sort of a, all futures lies to this sort of uh, more independence at a local level. Okay. Well, with that thought, I think we're going to leave it here. Yeah? Donald, thank you very much. And I hope Worldview gets back on its feet. So thank you for, for everyone for listening. And please subscribe.